Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with food, what to eat, when to eat, or how to keep from eating too much, then do we have the Mindful Eating Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ruth Williver, PhD, clinical health psychologist, director of research at Duke Integrative Medicine, and advisor to the Duke Diet and Fitness Center, health coach trainer, and the co-author of a fantastic book on changing your eating habits, The Mindful Diet. Today we'll talk about just that, about transforming your relationship with food for lasting weight loss, vibrant health, and better control over what you eat and when. That plus we'll talk about stealth calories, calorie bombs, the Goldilocks principle, why you want to graze like a cow, why you don't (laughs) want barbecue flavored cardboard, (laughs) and what in the world is a whoopie pie moment. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome to the show, Ruth. Are you ready to shine? Thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Almighty. Woohoo! (laughs) Woohoo! Awesome. So great to have you on the show. So before we dive right into things, have you always been interested in people's eating habits? I would, not always, but I would say for at least 25 years. So, you know. Not quite half my life. What got you interested in it? So there's one thing that was interesting to me about myself, Mm -hmm. but it was more like an interest in hindsight. So what actually got me interested in it was working at Duke's Diet and Fitness Center and working at uh, the Center for Living, as it was called at the time at Duke, where people that struggled with food were really taking a deep look at themselves and trying to change behavior in ways that were sustainable. And what was fascinating about the process is as we kind of dove in and began to understand what was going on, um, it also, of course, let me look at myself more deeply. Mm -hmm. And that's where the moment of, of hindsight was so interesting because I have always loved chocolate chip cookie dough. It's my go-to if I'm, if I'm stressed. You, you don't understand. We had, Jessica and I had a whole conversation on chocolate chip cookies on your book earlier today <laughs> when we were out on a, on a mindful run. So <laughs> That's great. So I, I like the synchronicity here. All right, chocolate yeah. chip cookie dough, go. <laughs> I like so, your style. Yeah. <laughs> So it's always been kind of a joke among my uh, family, particularly my siblings, that, you know, if we're all hanging out together, like you'll get back with your family of origin, you know, and you sort of slide into old patterns and I'll go for start making some chocolate chip cookie dough or even buy the, you know, quick kind now. And and my husband will be like, "Uh oh, (laughs) this is bad. This is a bad sign (laughs) because over time. I paired it, you know, I paired like, like we do. That's how we learn. We pair something that we find comforting with a time when we need comfort. Mm-hmm. So it's just been, uh, it's been fascinating to learn about myself in the process too. So this shortcuts the entire book, but I've got to go there. And, and I've been, part of it is coming from a professional sports background. I am on the high side of the motivation scale. I can say I'm going to do something and for better or worse, often for worse, if it's not kind, gentle, easy, good, I'll just uh-huh. do it. <laughs> I, so I have a fairly healthy diet, you could say. And, and I've, I've tried different diets out, but I have a fairly healthy, we won't even call it a diet, lifestyle eating choices. But darn it, after all these years, those quote unquote comfort foods still call. <laughs> <laughs> They do. Of course they do. And interestingly, they're, you know, they're meant to. I mean, the food industry spends millions and millions of dollars on the science of how to actually override our innate satiety mechanisms. There was a, some study that we, we quote in the book that in this particular year, I want to say it was, you know, eight or nine years ago, but in this particular year, they looked at the budget for five big food companies mm-hmm. that, um, and specifically the line item that was around marketing for things that were highly processed, you know, a lot of sugar, salt, and so forth. And the the budget for it, for these five food companies of marketing was about... Um, 
gosh, four or five times greater than the entire budget for the CDC, for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, we're comparing, I mean, really just sort of apples and oranges. So there's a lot of push to um, have us, you know, uh, have our flavor, what, what we can get from food quickly and immediately override what this body would sort of naturally respond to. So I creating in essence, creating, you know, more, more desire for it and um, an almost insatiable uh, wish for, for sweet. So, and it's, it's tough. So that kind of begets the question. I think we've kind of, in a sense, already gone there. What is mindless automatic eating? And maybe it's something that we're almost all doing on some level. Oh, yes. I mean, so it's a normal part of behavior. The problem is that we're doing it a lot, a lot of the time. So like most kinds of behavior, you know, doing it in moderation sometimes is one thing. But when we're doing it all the time, that's when it becomes um, problematic. So what it is. So mindless um, eating is really a process of eating without paying attention. And we get into patterns and create habits Um, you know, in lots of areas of our life, I'm speaking about eating now, but we could pick any area of life. It's really how our brains work. So we do particular behaviors in a sequence. There's often some kind of cue that starts it. There's a sequence of behaviors and some reward that sort of seals it or ends the sequence. And that process becomes so ingrained, the more you do it, that it actually gets stored in the brain in a way that you can... Uh, trigger it or set it off with the initial cue and you don't have to pay attention at all. So it's, it's great if you need your attention for other things, but what happens is where we actually do need to be attending then, we stop attending. So for instance, if we are used to, I don't know, writing or sending email or something of the sort where we, we snack a little bit, uh, when we do that, we'll go and get that bag of chips, for instance, or, or that Diet Coke or whatever, and be eating and drinking it while we're writing without even knowing that we did it. Exactly. And we may be, you know, we may even be aware that we've, we're getting it, but then we'll get so focused on what we're doing that we just eat and suddenly it's like, whoa, where'd that bag go? Or, whoa, you know, I think I had a whole thing of cookies when I started this. And it happens when driving a lot, right? Like that's one of the reasons that if, you, um, if you're working really hard on uh, making your health behavior, your eating behavior in particular, more healthy, it's really useful to not eat in the car or to eat at your desk or places where you have a lot of distraction. You just triggered a thought. You, you triggered an amygdala response. <laughs> If we're driving down the road, and also if we're working at some points, we may have that sympathetic nervous system going up, the fight or flight response going, which then I'm guessing is going to have a sugar craving to try to allow us to to flee from danger well-fueled. Yeah. So, you know, what it appears to be is that yes is the short answer, and it depends on how intense the response is, right? If the... If the uh, response is so intense. If if the stress, you know, you're about to be shot or something, the stress response would be so intense that you actually lose your appetite. Makes sense. You'll you'll beget the cookie to get the heck out of there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can make a trade off, right? So so let's go to a fun study from there on something we might not beget, which is Cornell University and clear candy bowls. Because I want to talk about what we see is what we eat. Yes. It's so true. So, uh, yeah, what they did in their study was they compared what would happen if you had a bunch of candy in a bowl that was opaque, so you couldn't see through it, versus a bowl that was clear. And people ate, on average, took more from the clear candy bowl. It's what what some people joke around about the seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. But that's how we're that's how we're built, right? We are very sensory driven creatures, and in particularly our visual sense. So we see things, and that kind of creates desire or memory of what it, how nice it is to eat that thing. And if we're not really paying attention, if we're just responding by habitual response, then we're likely to to go forward and eat it. So we want to start getting opaque colored bowls and and it's something you talk about later um you call it i think it's 
portion bowls, and I think you get the smallest bowl that you can, because what was that study, I'm, I'm going to completely misquote it here, about the, uh, the endless bowl of soup? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What they did in that study was fascinating. They had a sort of funnel at the bottom or whatever, and they, they could push soup up into the bowl. So they had people eat and eat and eat until there were many different series in this experiment. Um, and basically what they were trying to sort out is when do people attend to the time it's time to be done versus the, you know, the container is empty and that's why I'm done because the food is gone versus more of an internal cue. You know, my body's actually telling me I've had enough. And that last cue that my body's actually telling me this is a really quiet cue. <laughs> it's a really quiet. So we've got to learn how to listen for it, particularly in the midst of our busy, busy lives. Oh, I think it was a, a Deepak Chopra, Dr. Deepak Chopra book I read many years ago, where mm -hmm. he talked about don't get that, put that last portion on your plate, wait five minutes and ask yourself, am I still hungry? Yes. What a great piece of wisdom. Very useful. And, you know, Brian Wansink, who's done a lot of work on mindless eating, yes. um, I believe he found that people eat like 92% of what's on their plate independent of the plate size. And so that goes back to your point about, you know, have smaller, more appropriate plates or bowls or whatever you're serving yourself out of, because we are going to have a greater experience of uh, satiety and of having had enough. If we see that we're cleaning out our, you know, whatever it is that we're serving ourselves in. So it's okay to still be a member of the Clean Plate Club if it's a small <laughs> plate. <laughs> exactly. It, it's actually a kind of a strategy to use. Yeah. I like it. So let's, let's back up again for a minute. And we joked before the, the show that it's called the Mindful Diet, but it's really about a lot more than that. And in fact, I guess one could say that the diet or how we look is in a sense an expression of many different components. And maybe we can talk about that briefly. I love this, what you call the wheel of health. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So the wheel of health, um, it's actually a concept used in a lot of different integrative medicine or holistic health programs where instead of, you know, looking at some particular aspect of your life, like a, uh, an individual body organ, for example, and how well it's functioning, you're really taking a much broader look at how each domain in your life is playing out for you and the degree to which you're satisfied in each area of your life. So it has various areas like your so physical activity, how much you move the body, very important. Um, nutrition, very important. But also um, sleep, very important. And rest, um, not just when you're sleeping, but, you know, adequate time for recuperation. And play and personal development and growth and spirituality and communication and relationships, even the environments that we're in, both on a kind of meta level, but mm -hmm. also like the, the room that you hang out in or the office space you hang out in. And people have differing levels of um, desire to make those different areas or domains on the wheel of health. Um, a re, you know, a, say a 10 out of 10, meaning that they are very satisfied in that area. What we have people do is look at all these areas of, in their lives and then assess kind of how satisfied are they at where do they want to be and where are they now and what's interesting is that there's so many different drivers to why people eat when they don't actually need food you know we eat for a lot of different reasons sometimes it's because we actually need nutrition but a lot of times it's not and so really the whole exploration and using mindfulness as a way of doing some, some self-exploration um, just allows us to understand kind of the drivers that um, instill our behavior or kind of that 
make us uh, tick the way we tick. <laughs> I like it. And I loved, I took, I took that survey and I, I didn't check anything as a 10 because I wanted to leave some room for growth in there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I, very nice. <laughs> so when there were, there were mainly six to eights, I could point out a couple relationships and communication. The relationship mm -hmm. with my wife is great. I communicate great, but I want more, uh -huh. more connections with my friends. I think that could certainly help. And yeah. um, stress management, I do well, but I can certainly do better. That one I found fascinating because that actually tripwires another response because er earlier on when we were doing the show, we're a daily show. I read a book a day, interview a person pretty much a day and oh. having to learn how to manage that level of it's coming at you no matter what. And oh. I started to put on belly fat and, and I'm a fairly slim guy and I'm watching uh -huh. this going, well, this is kind of interesting. And that, <laughs> that was a response to stress, not yes. the quantity of food, but the body going, we need to hunker down and store right now. That's right. Yeah. And there's all these studies too. There were a lot of studies in the animal world, but now they've started to translate into the, you know, us humans as well, that, um, you know, we secrete more cortisol and store more fat right there in the abdominal area. Just in case, you know, the body is really smart, right? So it's just in case you need it. You're, you're stressed. You're dealing with challenges. So your body's going to put away a little extra just in case you need it. So is there a particular, this is kind of a loaded question since it's a wheel of health, but is there an area to focus on that we may be globally missing when it mm -hmm. comes to both our health and uh, diet or food? Yeah. Um, you know, my observation is that the nuances are quite different for different people. Mm -hmm. But if you put it all under the general umbrellas of stress and uh, relationships and connection, those are the places where we really have under focused. So people tend to go to food um, for sources of comfort. Mm -hmm. And that could be when we're lonely or feeling disconnected. Um, whether it's, you know, to the people that we live around or if I live by myself, you know, to my community at large or even to something larger than ourselves. So the connection piece, I think, is really a, a big one. And then the other is is stress. So we are so uh, accustomed now to the amount of stimulation that comes in all the time. And our brains actually we're not our, just our brains, but our whole bodies were designed for a time that was a much slower pace. So we have negative uh, impacts on uh, living in these very, very fast environments unless, from a health perspective, unless we're actually actively doing things to try to kind of compensate and allow the system to reset. So what I have found is that people often um, get the most uh, bang, if you will, by first focusing on where in their world they can actually learn to manage stress better. And if they clear a little off their plate, then they surprise themselves with finding energy that they can put toward planning for healthier food or for exercise or more sleep or whatever it is they need. Um, but stress is usually, I think, one of the key missing pieces. And it, it sounds like uh, mindfulness and, and all things that encompasses can help in many different levels when it comes to eating, when it comes to our diet, because we get the stress levels down, we become more present, we become more comfortable with our bodies. Maybe mm -hmm. you can introduce us to Mindfulness 101, particularly around this topic. Sure. Um, I think you've, you've said it really well, Michael. So the, you know, mindfulness is the practice of paying attention and doing it in a particular way with an attitude that's kind of a, a detective attitude where you're curious and there's kindness and you're kind of holding and seeing what's what's here right now, not trying to push it away or avoid it, but just really trying to um, acknowledge and watch a little distance 
from a little distance what it is that's here right now. So it's a paying attention, Kabat-Zinn, John Kabat-Zinn, um, this is his definition, I just think it's uh, such a nice one. It's paying attention in a particular way with this kindness and curiosity intentionally. So he describes mindfulness as the practice of paying attention um, on purpose, so intentionally, with a particular kind of attitude, which is one of kind of curiosity about what's here. And um, it's interesting when you start paying attention in this way, you observe so many things that we miss, typically, unless we're really present. So, you know, one of the ways our minds have been sort of trained as a function of our, our culture, I think, as much as anything, is to think ahead, ahead, ahead. We're, we're worried about what's ahead or we're planning for what's ahead. Or think about what's behind. Maybe we're regretful for something or missing something. And it's actually fairly rare that we're fully focused on being here, you know, right now. You, I, a lot of times people can relate to the idea of uh, you get in a car and you're driving and then at some point, you know, if you're on a road trip or something and it's monotonous, at some point you sort of zone out and then you, you kind of come back present again and you're like, whoa, where did I go? I just have gone 80 miles. I don't even remember those possible turnoffs. Scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that process of, you know, our minds can go other places. Um does not serve us well mm -hmm. when we're making decisions about uh, food and what to take into the body and when we're making decisions about um, things that are going to have a uh, impact later. So, so let's, let's go from there then and let's talk about, well, maybe let's talk real briefly about the science and mindfulness or, mm -hmm. or even the science, mindfulness and uh, eating. Sure. Well, so on the on the broader picture, so mindfulness has been a sort of studied in academia for, I don't know, several dozen years. Kabat-Zinn's first program was like in 78 or 79, but it really was not moved kind of out of the quote unquote ivory towers until the last decade, last uh, 10 to 12 years. There's been this incredible upward trajectory of peer reviewed research where Scientists are taking their findings um, of what was working sort of clinically or, or in clinics and checking them out on a larger scale. So we're now seeing mindfulness in schools, in corporations, in various programs. There's a, I heard a really interesting presentation on a mindfulness training um, for police. I heard an in interesting presentation on mindfulness training for executives. You know, so there's just the implications of how to actually uh, use mindfulness to shift the way you show up in the world um, are just are huge. So that work had been going on. And then um, about a decade ago, um, I connected with Jean Christeller, mm -hmm. who is very interested in this work. And this has been one of her kind of life's passions. And um, Jean had had a graduate student who was interested in the work. And they had done a um, pilot study of women with um, a compulsive eating pattern and basically worked with mindfulness and, and applied it to um, various aspects around food. And Jean was interested in studying it more um, formally. Mm -hmm. And so um, she and I, the, just a short version of the story, <laughs> is that uh, she and I um, applied for um, a grant, and, and we basically ended up with a, a series of grants where first we looked at if we applied mindfulness to the process of eating, specifically with people that had a, a binge eating disorder. So an eating disorder where they felt out of control, mm -hmm. where they ate way beyond what was um, comfortable, and experienced a lot of distress about their eating patterns. And what we found in that, we found two main things. So one is we found that 
compared to other kind of at the time state of the art um, approaches to deal with binge, binging or binge eating disorder, the mindfulness approach was equally solid in terms of uh, regulating the actual pattern of eating. So helping people get to a normal pattern of eating. And the part that I just have always been fascinated by is that even though both of the active groups compared to the control group, it was a three-group study, both of the active treatment groups improved their eating. Mm -hmm. It was only the mindfulness group that improved in two things. One, in measures of um, how well they internalized the change, how integrated it felt to them um, so that they no longer felt like they were struggling against food or struggling to restrain or refrain from eating. So it was, they felt much easier to be around food without experiencing the same pull that they had previously experienced. And then the other thing we found is that um, only the mindfulness group improved their metabolism. Cool. Sp- yeah, so specifically what happened was insulin sensitivity was better mm-hmm. um, after eating a meal. We had like standardized meals, if you will. And if, if we looked at people before, during, and after eating a specific amount. And the people in the mindfulness group basically shifted how their body um, metabolized the food to a much healthier place. This sounds like, um, I'm going to get the names wrong at the moment, but okay. the hor- there's a hormone that tells you you're full. There's a hormone that tells you you're still hungry. Right. And you were based on their newfound experience presence, their new presence with food. They were literally switching their hormone levels. Yes. Yeah, so what we found was that, that insulin sensitivity improved. So the things that we did see change were a lot of the, the metabolic markers, but we weren't looking at appetite regulation hormone. So ghrelin is the hormone that lets you know with, when you're hungry. And leptin is one of the ones in PYY336. And there's some others that let you know when you're full or, or at least have had enough. Um, so in that first study, we actually weren't unfortunately measuring for that. Uh, we went and did a second study where um, we thought, well, okay, so people that have dysregulated eating, this definitely helps for, but we have a much bigger issue in this country um, where people don't have a diagnosable eating disorder, but are basically just tuned out when they're mm-hmm. eating. And um, the, we, the question, the hypothesis was, you know, would this approach help people actually learn to tune in better? And would we see a shift in weight over time, you know, as a function of that? And Jean went on and ran that study and found that indeed people did lose weight um, as a function of using this mindfulness approach. Not like crazy rapid weight loss, gradual, subtle, consistent, sustainable weight loss. That that to me That's is the key too. word. That's right. And then the third study we did is, you know, so there are a lot of ways to help people lose weight, but sustainable is the key, as you say. So in, in our third uh, research program, then we looked at if we took people that had lost a significant amount of their body weight and the average, uh, people had to have lost at least 9% to be in the study, but the average was like 17%. So people had lost, you know, huge amounts of weight in the previous couple of years. Could this approach help them keep that weight off? And we tracked them. We had them in total for about 16 months. And it definitely was successful. Um, It was, there's, there are other ways that are successful too. So it wasn't superior to other ways, Mm -hmm. but it was one approach where people had not regained weight 16 months later, which 98% of people regain weight within five years. I mean, the, the, the stats are pretty sobering. So well, diet, dieting is really stacked against you. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So what was it, 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 in a nutshell, what were the main components that you were doing with this group uh, or groups to help yeah. them both get it under control and get, it's more of a, to me, it sounds like more of a life learning. It's almost they were given an owner's manual for themselves. And so when the study ends, it doesn't matter. You're not throwing away the manual. <laughs> 
That's what a nice way to put it. And actually, I think it was structuring a time where they kind of found their own owner's manual, right? Because what I find might make it really hard for me to resist the cookie dough might for you be nothing, right? So we're all going to, we all have our own idiosyncrasies. And so learning in essence how to, you know, settle your nervous system, how to check in and see what's going on to recognize what emotion you have if you have an emotion and what it might be suggesting you need. What what we were doing that was very different mm-hmm. than what a lot of programs do is we weren't telling people this is what you need to do. You need to eat this or not eat that. Instead, we were telling people you need to figure out what you really need. And if what you really need is companionship, then food's not going to give it to you. I mean, it'll distract you. It'll be you know, a companion for a brief period, right? But ultimately, it's not going to help you. If what you really need is sleep, you know, taking on a carb load may give you a little bit of energy for a while, but ultimately, you're going to have to learn to take better care of yourself, allowing your body more rest to not have this sort of need creep back up. So basically we were using mindfulness to help people learn different aspects of themselves. So one was about how their emotional world worked. Mm -hmm. Um, Another was to um, learn how their thought processes worked. So to be able to kind of watch when their thinking would get really skewed and when uh, they would believe their thoughts were true. So you know, thoughts are an interesting, thoughts are just a mental event, right? And there are sort of interpretation of something we're observing. And they may be true, but they may be totally inaccurate and not true at all. And yet we tend to operate as if they're true, unless we, you know, step back and kind of evaluate, hmm, is that true? You know, I'm kind of building my whole behavior around that, but I don't know if that's true. So getting people used to um, taking a look at and putting some distance between their automatic thoughts and their kind of typical reactions to their thinking um, was another, was a second area that mindfulness really helped. And then the third area was um, sensation. So a lot of times we feel a sensation and react to it without um, either fully experiencing it or understanding what it means. Mm -hmm. So for example, it's not uncommon that people feel anxious and they have a little kind of whir in the gut, especially in the belly or even up into the chest, and they assume that it's hunger and go to food when really maybe what they need is to settle the nervous system or to take the edge off the anxiety and there may not be hunger there at all. So what's, what is a good tool? And, and there are many tools. In fact, you have a mindfulness toolkit. <laughs> what is a good tool to say, hmm, what's really going on here? Yes. So we teach people... Um, different ways of applying mindfulness meditation, but the basic practice of the formal sitting practice of mindfulness meditation um, is, the, to me, the most useful tool. Oh, I'm hearing like a truck in the background. Do you? You, you do, but I'm on, oh. an, it, you're listening on a different mic. You actually hear me on something that's by my computer screen versus this here which actually records. This is a, an, an NFL uh, broadcasting mic. Oh, so if you're wow. in a giant stadium and, you know, there's 50,000 <sighs> people and you don't hear the background noise, okay. you hear the announcer. So, Got yeah, it. you heard okay. a truck gurgling on by. Okay, sorry. I thought, no, oh, no, no it's totally <laughs> understandable. It means you are very present and aware <laughs> And taking notice and going, wouldn't and you're you've stepped back enough. You've done the practice enough um, that you are able. This this is my area too. We actually we made a program you'll find online, mindfulrunning.org. That's my wife and myself. Oh, cool! So we're down we're down this rabbit hole with you. You're stepping back several layers to not only say, I'm speaking, and I hear this sound going on. I wonder if it's important for Michael to know 
that this sound is going on. So not only are you being the observer, you're being a compassionate observer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So right. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. What a great way of taking that moment and turning it into a, a learning moment. So, so what I was saying was the basic practice of mindfulness, I just think, has creates a learning opportunity for so many things and um that's to me the strongest tool um that people can use to start to observe themselves and how they relate to their body how they relate to their thoughts how they relate to the world around them can we talk, let's talk maybe about one or two more things in the toolkit, then we'll jump into some sp food specific items. Okay. Do you have one or two that you think also would be near the top of that list? Yeah. So I, you know, the, the 20 breaths practice is a really short practice mm -hmm. and um, people do it frequently. And it was one of the tools that people reported to us they used the most, mm -hmm. um, probably in part because it was so short. Um, so the 20 breaths practice is a practice I was introduced to by Michael Baim at Penn. It's basically 20 really short meditations all in a row where you're gathering up all of your attention on this particular in-breath and out-breath. And then you count them as you go. Everybody has their own pace, but you count from one up to 10 mm -hmm. and then back from 10 to one. Excuse me. So you... Um, are counting just to kind of keep your, your place, but you're uh, amplifying your focus on the experience of that breath just for that, you know, few seconds of that breath. And I think you would add to it uh, an important caveat, non-judgment when your mind goes astray. Totally. So that, you know, that to me is the real key in being able to use mindfulness um, as a learning paradigm, particularly around food. Um, we are so mean to ourselves. I mean, we're really, really harsh judges of others and of ourselves. And when we're being really harsh and critical, then we also get tricky about uh, kind of what we're going to allow ourselves to see. You know, if I have to go and... Um, uh, report to a very harsh judge all the things I've done wrong, I'm going to be a lot more careful than if I'm going to go report to a loving, kind, um, accepting um, being. So for me, the non-judgment piece and recognizing how quick we are to judge mm -hmm. is a really useful part in creating an attitude of um, acceptance and friendliness in which I can then learn more about myself. Sounds like a great healthy coaching relationship and in this <laughs> case you're coaching yourself. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Let's go from there. In fact, let's talk about what you call, it, it's actually uh, in your book as mindfulness number three, flexing your kindness muscle. Ah, yes, yes. So it really has to do with um, the use of non-judgment mm -hmm. and simultaneously with cultivating um, uh, with cultivating kindness with with um, allowing yourself to be human, giving yourself uh, space to be who you are, recognizing that we all you know have thoughts we don't want to have and we're not in control of them. Where we are in control more is on what we do to react or what we do to um, from a behavior perspective. Same thing with emotion. We have a lot of emotions. It's part of being human. So being um, allowing of the full range of, of human emotion really important. And then recognizing that a lot of things can contribute to behavior. And so even though we like to sometimes believe that we're in control of everything, it's pretty complicated <laughs> and we ain't, right? So um, giving ourselves, you know, permission to try things and make mistakes and learn by trial and error. You know, that's so interestingly, that's how you learn behaviorally. 
you learn by trial and error. Error has to be part of it. Which is fascinating because since we were young, we were taught if you get something wrong, you screwed up. Which means how do we learn by trial and error when we're taught error is so bad? Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I, I think part of being able to uh, apply the mindset well is creating experiments that you're it, framing it as an experiment. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go try something and see what happens. Not you're going to do this and you're going to, you know, never eat an unhealthy thing again or, you know, make up some kind of rule that is a setup, which is a total setup. Absolutely. I like what you're saying so much because it takes us out of the, really, it takes us out of the parental role where you're going to report back to a taskmaster. You have to say how it got, how it went. And if it didn't go well, if it didn't go even perfect, you completely glow, give up in frustration. It becomes this black or white. I've got to never have sugar again, or I'm headed to Krispy Kreme. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and as you say, that's a setup. When we, and when we divide the world into that, all or nothing, right? The sort of black and white, this dichotomous thinking, we're setting ourselves up because the world is not that simple. I mean, we do it out of an intention to make things more clear, right? It can be confusing. What should I eat? There's so many things to choose from. So there's a good intention behind it, but having um, more flexible guidelines as opposed to black and white rules is a more useful approach. I like it. So let's go from that flexible, not so black and white. Can you tell us about the Goldilocks principle? Oh, yes, exactly. So the Goldilocks principle um, is this idea. Tana Hannon, who um, helped us with the book, is uh, it was her, her phraseology, and I just love it. So, you know, Goldilocks finds out that one bear... Um, this porridge was too hot and the next bears was too cold and then baby bears was just right. So the goal is to eat, for example, a whole lot of whole foods, fruits and vegetables and grains and so forth. And it doesn't mean that you can never eat processed foods. You want to get as much whole food as you can and sometimes you're going to have processed food because that's a lot more convenient so you find a middle ground that'll work for you i think it's also very kind and gentle on yourself because we were talking earlier and i said i have the ability to just go and take it out <laughs> but that's cruel <laughs> And, yeah, and it stacks yeah. up when you do that. And, and there are studies that show that your motivation level goes down in other places because if you squash it there, it's coming back up elsewhere. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. It makes total sense. So if you say, I'll allow myself to have some, some crackers, the occasional cookie, yeah. whatever it is. Let's go from there. Let's talk about the hunger fullness scan and and where we want to keep our numbers and the two big mistakes we make around um, when we eat. Yes. So the two big mistakes we make are that often we don't eat when we're hungry. We will ignore our body signals. And so we get to a place where we're ravished and we'll eat anything in sight. And we you know, no longer even have good, clear thinking processes because our blood sugar is so low. <laughs> the other is that we eat way beyond we've had enough. We eat way beyond normal fullness. And part of the issue with that is a speed issue. We eat fast and it does take our appetite hormones, our appetite regulation hormones, you know, a good 20 minutes to register. So, we finish eating, we're going to continue to feel more and more full for a good 20 minutes, at least, um, depending on how long the actual eating period is. It could be 30, 40 minutes. So what we do with the hunger fullness scale, it's a seven point scale, and we teach people to give a number to different sets of sensations from what it's like at the bottom, a one, when you're very, very, very hungry to what it's like when you're at a seven, very, very, very full. And what's fascinating is there, there's a lot of similarities. Both of them are painful and um, are uh, situations where you feel sick, you don't have energy, you feel either really lethargic or sluggish. 
Um, and they're both signs of being really out of sync, having the mind and the body be really kind of disconnected, if you will. So what we're going for is eating when we're a little bit hungry, not tiny, but moderately hungry, and then stopping when we're, we've had just enough, when we're a little full, but not when we start to think, oh, I can't fit another bite in. At that point, we've way past the uh, fullness <laughs> mark. So here is a crazy question, and, and, and I'm thinking I, I did a uh, foreign exchange program. I was racing bicycles in Europe a long, long time ago, and I stayed with this family that ate food very, very slowly. <laughs> How do we eat? How should we? Not that it's a should, would, a coulda, but what's yeah. a good way to eat? Right. Well, in terms of maximizing the body's ability to digest and our ability to fully recognize the signals that our body is trying to communicate to us, we do need to eat more slowly mm -hmm. and with greater attention to the whole process so that we fully experience the food that we're eating. So the body can digest well and we can fully register what we've taken in. There's also some wonderful research about how just the speed itself dictates um, some of the appetite regulation hormones. So we see changes even eating the same amount at different speeds. Mm -hmm. When we eat slower, we have a sense of being more full sooner, which if we then attend to that, we don't need as much food. I love taking my meals, and when I have the time, first off, if Jessica, my wife, she's the producer, if she says, Michael, food, I'm like racing down to the kitchen, <laughs> getting, getting away from this pixelator in front of me here. <laughs> and if not, if I have the time, I'll go and sit outside with, with my plate and try to enjoy it, even put my feet on the ground mm. and connect. Are there studies that show, or is it just something intuitive at this point, that being in front of what I'm calling the pixelator here warps uh -huh. how much we're going to eat. Interesting. Well, there are studies that show that when we're distracted, we eat more. Mm -hmm. And I think it would fall into that. Um, but the other thing you're pointing to is when you are fully, um, you're supporting full presence by attending to your senses. You know, you go outside, maybe you feel the sun or the wind. You are able to be more in the body. And when you're more um, sort of physically present, you actually, I mean, you're better, you're better able to digest, but you also process information differently. Um, and as that compared to like in the pixelator and you've got your cognitive brain thinking, 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 and you know. What do I do about this email and that? And the, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, um, and, and I'd say, I'd say the food even tastes better, which is strange, but getting away, it, it has a different taste to it. It does. It totally does. I have, uh, this is one of my favorite stories, this totally delightful woman who was in actually one of our earliest, um, groups. She, she, it was, she was so much fun to watch her learn basically because she would come in and she'd share her enthusiasm about stuff. And so she was talking about how the paying attention, the process of paying attention changed flavors and also brought her insight through that. So she said she sat down for her meal and she did a, a mindful um, a practice, a brief mindful practice to then rate her hunger so she knew where she was starting. And um, when she looked down at her meal, then she said, wow, I'm so excited to eat, but this is nothing but a dead bird. Oh, Why no. am I so excited? <laughs> Gratitude, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. On the other side, you know, we, we find sometimes that we actually like things we didn't think we liked. Mm -hmm. And we find that we don't like foods we thought we really liked. The process of paying attention changes the, the whole flavor experience. That makes perfect sense. So let's dive. We've just got a, a little bit left before we jump into a, a brief meditation. Maybe okay. we could talk about the four pillars of healthy eating and, and start with pillar number one, eating to manage inflammation. And this is one I do a lot, and I think of all foods that way. Um, so I'm excited to hear about this one. Eating to manage information. In inflammation. 
Oh, I thought you said information. I was thinking, I don't remember that. Book. Now, that would be in needing to manage information. <laughs> That's like eating your computer screen or your smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, so there are so many processed foods and so many um, high uh, sugar foods that um, that contribute to a state of, of inflammatory to, to a state of inflammation, pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body. And those have been shown to be related to lots of different chronic diseases. So um, eating to manage inflammation, you're trying to get good, healthy fats mm -hmm. and um, not have as much um, saturated fats and some of the um, other kinds of fats that are less healthy. You're really trying to maximize um, healthy fat and a, a complex carbohydrate um, together. Uh, this actually helps manage hunger um, as well. But in essence, um, you know, my, my co-author Beth Reardon is a nutritionist and um, she talks about how you, every bite we take in, we're taking it into this biochemical environment, you know, and, and it's bathed in chemicals and we are creating those as well based on what we're taking in. So the process of thinking, you know, oh, this little bit doesn't matter actually isn't accurate because chemically you are changing your internal environment based on every single thing that you swallow. Makes sense. I'm always looking at what has the highest antioxidant value. Can I, can I sneak some more wild blueberries in here, steal some curcumin or turmeric in here? Yes, yes. Well, I am sure Beth would be delighted to come talk to you. She's the one with the deep knowledge about those things. Fantastic. So yeah. let, let's jump from there. That's pillar number one, eat to manage inflammation. Can you tell us real briefly, eat for blood sugar balance? Yes. So eat for blood sugar balance um, is related to the fact that as our sugar spikes in the blood and then crashes, we have all sorts of um, intense energy responses, right? We get more energy and then we're, ugh. And so to eat for balance, um, basically you want to eat high fiber mm -hmm. and you want to combine it with a healthy fat. So you have, you know, um, celery with a natural, you know, nut butter on the top. You have um, some kind of high wheat cracker or high grain cracker with um, a kind of a skim cheese so that you basically are putting things together that slow down absorption. The fiber helps to slow down the absorption so that you don't have a fast uh, rush, a blood sugar rush. And that's also why it's important to eat whole fruits. Um, so, you know, if you, t if you drink a glass of orange juice versus eating the whole orange, the blood sugar response is going to be totally different. You get a lot more fiber with the orange and the body can absorb more slowly the sugars. A, a quick story on that. When I was oh, mm -hmm. many years ago, probably two decades ago, and I had blood sugar sensitivities until I figured it out with my diet in the last uh, three or four years. And this has been, I'm now uh, almost a year coming up on close of being able to eat fruits again and things that aren't wow. super low on the glycemic index. And I'm fine. Uh. It's like eating fruits is the sweetness of life. So I'm yeah. so happy about that. But 20 years ago, I went out to, I think I was going to drive like up north to meet my mom with her car or something. I'd graduated college and I drank a, a cup or half glass of orange juice, got in the car, drove off, passed out, hit a guardrail, <gasps> totaled the car for oh, my, my orange juice. Wow. It's, it was pure sugar because it took out all the fiber from it. Right, right. Wow. Well, that's, you know, most people know that if somebody's going into like a diabetic crisis, you get them orange juice because it's the quickest way to get them, you know, pure sugar. So, uh, yeah. So, okay, <laughs> pillar number four, eat a plant-based diet. What does that mean? Yeah, so it means get most of your uh, proteins from plants, um, from soy, from legumes. Um, it's not to say that, you know, meat is doesn't have good things to offer, but more plant-based um, proteins is based, there's just a lot of data at this point that shows that from a chronic illness prevention perspective, more plant-based is going to carry you further. Woohoo! 
<laughs> <laughs> Speaking from personal experience. So what, what is a calorie bomb? A calorie bomb is a huge load of calories at one time. I think, um, I can't remember if this is the example that we give in the book or just one that I use a lot in groups, but uh, we talk about the blooming onion sometimes, which is a, a thing that Outback serves, and it's basically this onion that's cut in all these different little ways and battered and deep fried, and it's so delicious, and people get it, and they munch on it, you know, with a drink as they're waiting for their steak, and it has some crazy, it's like 4,200 calories or something, so, you know, it's like more food than you should eat for a couple of days. Oh, my this, God. One little appetizer. <laughs> I used to, I used to, I did a bike ride, 5,000 mile, 40 day across the country thing. And, and uh, I, I, one of the things I would do is stop and get this bean burrito called, it was horrible for you. You get it at like a 7-Eleven called The Bomb. And The <laughs> Bomb was probably only like 2,700, 4,200 calorie <laughs> onion. How do they do it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but that's the that's the other thing about, you know, eating uh, whole foods is that you at least know, it, well, when you're doing the cooking or the cooking's being done in your home anyway, you at least know what's going into them. And it's much more difficult when you're when you're buying prepared foods. And the, with the prepared foods, they've got just like we bringing it full circle, they've got the chemicals in there. So it short circuits anything and you don't even realize you're completely full, your stomach's distended and you're going, <laughs> wow. That feels better than the first bite. I need some more of that. Right, because you've, what you've done is got your dopamine systems going and your, your brain is telling you, ooh, reward, reward, let's get some more. <laughs> Nobody can eat just one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so why do we want to graze like a cow? So grazing like a cow is very helpful because then you're giving your, your body a source of nutrient at a regular interval and it basically comes to expect it mm -hmm. and fully utilize the the nutrients that you're giving it. When we go for long periods of time without eating, um, and, and unfortunately this is quite common, we'll, you know, I know a lot of people that actually will start their day and maybe they'll drink coffee, but they really won't eat until dinner. And then by that point, they while they haven't been paying attention to um, potential need to eat, by that point, people are so hungry that then just eat and eat and eat and our decision making isn't very good and um, the amount of calories that we take in um, late in the day after a huge time of not having any um, regular nutrient sources basically also um, makes a shift to your metabolism. One of my favorite studies um, had people eat the same, it was an isocaloric study, so mm -hmm. people in the different conditions were eating the same number of calories, but in one group they only ate once a day, in another group they ate three times a day, and in another group they ate five times a day, same amount of calories but divided in five. The people that only ate once a day gained weight. The people that ate um, three times a day maintained weight, and the people that ate the five times same calorie load um, actually lost a little weight. So it's you know it's not just how much; it's also the pattern that we're used to. What do you think the people? It, it may have been outside the scope of the study. Uh, what do you guess the people felt? One versus three versus five. I'm betting that. One was probably kind of disconnected um, during the day from what the body needs because if you're actually paying attention, you generally feel hungry until you learn not to. I mean, I actually have had a lot of clients tell me, I just don't feel hungry. But part of it is that they um, are trained to not pay attention to these really quiet signals. So there is a training involved in kind of reconnecting with what we innately knew how to do at birth. And I'm guessing the people on the five times a day were more satisfied and had a more kind of, you know, level, easier keel to, um, to the day. That tends to be the way I go. So is, is more of grazing like a cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Real briefly, stealth calories. <laughs> stealth calories? Yes. So just there are calories that we don't even realize we're taking in uh, because they've been added to the food you know, a lot of times people also don't think about the calories that are in liquids. Um, and, you know, you, you get a Starbucks and you think, oh, I'm just getting coffee. But, well, if you get a Frappuccino or, you know, something like that, 
you've added hundreds of calories, but just adding, um, you know, the, the cream, adding uh, sugar um, in, in, little bi- in little bits over time tends to add up. That makes perfect sense. Let's go from there. And what's a whoopie pie moment? <laughs> so whoopie pie moment is the um, creation of uh, Beth Reardon, and my colleague who, who I wrote the book with. Um, when she was a child, she had a babysitter who um, made these special whoopie pies that were sort of chocolate cookies with some kind of, I believe, mint filling was her, her favorite, but you can make a lot of different kinds of fillings. And um, in essence, she uses the concept to talk about this particular um, moment being so worthwhile and celebratory that you're you're having a something that's you know high calories and you're really savoring it so you're taking full pleasure in it you're not missing any of the delight from it Mm -hmm. Um, and you're creating it in part by putting more attention on it as opposed to having a larger amount of it so it's um it's it's kind of a, an application of what we call taste satiety, where you're so tuned into the special moment um, and, and savoring, savoring is the process that uh, you really are thoroughly enjoying. Sort of like the individually wrapped chocolate bites versus going through several candy bars and still feeling hungry for more. Yes, exactly. And what what is missing is usually not the amount of food, what is usually missing is the attention that can make us feel a greater sense of satisfaction. That makes perfect sense. So what is, speaking of of taking more attention with the food, the importance of an attitude of gratitude? Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, intuitively, we know that gratitude is, is a good thing, if you will. And science is just finding so many benefits from holding an attitude where we're grateful and we recognize blessings and we recognize and actually cultivate positive and meaningful moments. They don't have to be huge. It's a matter of actually acknowledging what's there. You know, you connect with somebody you, you smell a beautiful flower, you notice the sun at a really pretty angle, you learn a new fact that's really interesting to you, just little blippets of things to be thankful for. And when people have an attitude that uh, reflects that, it has lots of different um, consequences, I should say. It has lots of different rollouts that are positive. And I think specifically when it comes to food, I think there's so much to be said for being grateful, even if, even maybe especially if what you're eating isn't the healthiest. I think if you take it with that attitude of gratitude, your body does much better with it. So one of the um, most useful uh, mindfulness practices right at the beginning of Mm -hmm. eating, um, whether it's a snack or a meal, is to take a moment to recognize what it took to create that. You know, we are so at this point um, removed from our food that we often forget, wow, this creature, this chicken, for example, lived its entire life so that I could get the energy from it that I'm now going to use to do something with, right? Or this, um, you know, this peas were grown and tended by somebody for an entire, at least one cycle, um, and then picked and then shipped to me and then prepared. There's so many steps to it. And what all goes into just a single meal is incredible that when we take it in, we have to recognize, wow, how many people have made a contribution and how many creatures have made a contribution to me having this particular source of energy. Thank you. And I, I love doing that myself is, is going through that whole chain uh, the person who put the fuel in the gas station that gave you the tractor and the <laughs> right. when you do that, it's so many people, but you feel you feel very appreciative for exactly. what you have in front of you. Exactly. Yeah, because it's incredible, and we just frequently tune out from it. 
What advice would you give to parents today around their kids for food? Mm. Yes, what a great question. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is to nourish what kids automatically know. So they know when they're hungry and they know when they've had enough. And um, instead of pushing the idea of cleaning your plate and instead of um, giving sweets as rewards, uh, helping them to conceptualize food as, you know, this is to help keep your body strong. This is to help keep your health solid. Um, and it, it should be pleasurable. It shouldn't be unpleasant, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just one of so many sources of pleasure. And kids intuitively know that, you know, they're playing all the time and they're connecting with other beings all the time. So um, honestly... Sometimes I feel like what we have to do is like not screw up <laughs> what's innate, you know. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the other thing is recognizing that just because a child wants something doesn't mean that they have to have it. I mean, there's some basic parenting that I think um, is really helpful for people to have that plays out with with food as well as with other things, you know, so the child says, I want a cookie, I want another ice cream, I want a this, and I don't want that. Um, again, helping people, kids, adults too, but helping us to learn our limits is is just a really important part of, of growing up. It's okay to want that and you can't have it, you it know. Almost, it almost sounds like when you do that, I never thought about it to this moment, you're helping them understand how to cool the jets for that next cookie or that next ice cream, which trains them to be self-regulating more later on. That is 100% correct. That's exactly right. You are teaching (laughs) self-regulation. Yeah. And it's such an important skill that actually um, some work is showing that we we have become uh, less, we've paid less and less attention to it and we're creating, you know, more and more impulsive, I want it now, fix it now kind of culture. Um, where knowing how to manage those impulses is really important. Couldn't agree more. From there, just a few quick wrap-up questions, then we'll jump into a meditation. First one, a really fun one. What personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Woohoo! Uh, so I have a really special, special child. Um, her name is Emma, mm-hmm. and she has something called Rett syndrome. So it's a neurodevelopmental um, condition, if you will. So she's she needs twenty four seven care, um, and she's unable to speak or purposefully use her body. And she has these huge eyes, and she gets what's going on, and she totally connects. And so my favorite. Um, moment is, and and we do this every morning, six times a week probably. Um, So when I meditate, she loves to go back to sleep after she eats her breakfast really early. And um, I can kind of hold her Mm -hmm. and we just have this lovely eye connection um, before I then go and meditate and and, uh, just like looking into her eyes and she gives me the most amazing smiles. I mean, there's just, there's just nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Like looking into the pools of the universe. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Wow. 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 Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. So from there, where can people go to find out more and to find your fantastic book? Yeah. So Amazon has it. Um, bookstores have it um, or can order it. If not, um, it was it was published by Scribner, uh, mm-hmm. Simon & Schuster House. And um, if they want to do it, and there are uh, recordings that are free to access to anybody um, that they, the link is, is noted in the book. Um, the other thing is um, I have left Duke and I'm actually was recruited by Vanderbilt. And so now I'm at Vanderbilt um, and uh, Duke is still offering a program uh, it's called Changing from Within, but it's based on these same uh, concepts. Um, if people want a class, you know, want to actually have somebody kind of guide them through it, 
So Duke is offering that and Vanderbilt, I hope, will be offering that. Um, and one other place to uh, find that kind of support from teachers um, is eMindful. Mm -hmm. eMindful.com um, is a company I'm the chief scientific officer for, and um, they do a lot of mindful uh, eating work and have courses that um, also support this. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch all those links, and there are quite a few, you're driving down the road, <laughs> go over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over as well. So any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? Um, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey. We're all learning all the time. And I think it's important that we let ourselves keep learning and don't push ourselves into... Um, trying to be something we're not, but continue to allow space for ourselves to, to grow, um, giving ourselves both time and attention to um, allow that to happen. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. wonder if you, you have time for a short guided meditation. Sure, now. definitely. All right, so I would invite people to... Allow their eyes to close if that feels okay. And if uh, they have a preference for eyes open, to just find a place down out three or four feet in front of them. And just let your gaze be soft and gentle. And just putting yourself into the position where your spine can be alert. But your shoulders can be relaxed. We'll just take a few moments here together. First, just observing what is. You might start with the sense of sound. And just notice any sounds that come and go. Just kind of alert to them, allowing them to move into your awareness. And perhaps pass on through. And just as you can attend to sound, you can also move some awareness down into your feet. And just getting a sense of the feet supported by the ground. You might notice where you feel pressure. You might notice how your weight is distributed across your feet. You might notice the texture if you have on socks or shoes or feel a carpet or a floor. And just getting a sense of your connection to the earth through your feet. And you might also move some of your awareness up to the breath. And allowing your attention 
to notice the breath rising and falling in the body. or expanding and releasing. And you don't have to do anything or make anything happen. You're just observing the wisdom of the body how it knows to breathe. And you might actually just notice the little pause at the top of an inhale. before the breath changes direction to become an exhale. Or you might notice the little pause at the bottom of the breath as an exhale pauses and the breath shifts direction to become an inhale. And if your mind wanders off or something pulls your attention away, just notice that, naming it and then gently bringing your attention back to the in-breath and the pause or the out breath and the pause. And then giving yourself the gift now of three full, comfortable breaths. And on the next one, or the one after that, when you're ready, just allowing your eyes to open again and expanding your attention back to your surroundings. And if your body is asking for any particular stretch, feel free to give that to yourself as well. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. well, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a true honor and a joy. I got to crank yeah. it back up for the finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying be well, have fun, get mindful diet. 
be present and kind with yourself, and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much. What a joy. I have really enjoyed this. Yay, yay, yay. As yay. did I. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>